Okay, we'll, we'll get started here and folks will probably keep arriving and uh, we'll do our usual introductions and some housekeeping. So welcome to the sixth in a series of Telemental Health Fundamentals. Tonight's training is called Risk Management and Telemental Health. This is brought to you by the Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Sarah Smucker Barnwell back with us again. And for other folks might not know this, but um, there's a person named Jennifer Verbeck who's behind the scenes also that makes sure that all this technical material happens really well. And thank you, Jennifer, for taking care of that for us. Uh, if you have any questions during this um, presentation, feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, uh, Sarah will stop several times. We'll gather up some questions and we'll ask her and kind of keep that conversation going. Uh, after the end of this evening, uh, I also wanted to mention that um, you will get a survey and, and the survey will give you a chance to give us some feedback on uh, our presentation. And we'll also be issuing certificates. Some of you might have gotten those already. If you uh, are by yourself and you registered, the certificate should come to you automatically. However, if you're in a group tonight and you're with several folks, uh, the routine is send us an email to the northwest at attcnetwork.org email address. Give us the names of the people you're with and their email addresses, and we'll make sure that they also get a certificate for night's attendance. Um, I got that survey thing a little bit out of, out of order. So you, you saw that slide with the survey just a second ago. And I also want to say thank you to all the folks that um, have been with us for these six sessions. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful to be uh, collaborating with you. And for anybody that's new tonight, welcome to tonight's session. Uh, we're, we're really glad to have you here. And in the chat box, I put a link where you can find the slides in a couple different formats. And also when you get the um, survey follow-up, there'll be a link to those slides available for you too. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Smucker Barnwell. And uh, Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you so much, David. And thank you so much to Northwest ATTC for hosting tonight. Thank you to Jen for making sure that it is running smoothly behind the scenes. And thank you to everyone who is here tonight and joining us, particularly those who have soldiered through six of these installations in the Telemental Health Fundamentals series. So tonight we're going to be speaking about risk management in telemental health. And, you know, we will invite you um, to watch these webinars that you missed. If you happen to miss one of the previous ones, I would invite you. They will be on demand on the ATTC Network website, which you can find here. Here are the others in the series. And then, of course, tonight's will eventually be there in about a week, I believe, Risk Management and Telemental Health. So I'm Sarah Sucker barnwell I am a clinical psychologist in Seattle, Washington. And I am very passionate about telemental health. This has been really the great focus and, and great pleasure of my career. You know, for me, uh, telemental health is the, you know, an incredibly important and timely tool that we can be using to protect the public's health, to expand care, and to make sure that we are increasing access to care to diverse populations in ways that I think are just, we are unable to otherwise. Uh, I've had the great fortune of working with wonderful colleagues in this space. I spent about a decade overseeing the telemental health programming for VA Puget Sound hospitals. Um, I was one of the authors of the American Psychological Association telepsychology guidelines, as well as other uh, organizations that offer best practice guidelines documents. I'm, I'm also a former Center for Excellence and Substance Abuse Training and Education Fellow. And so the opportunity to speak to folks who work in the substance use disorder space and have an interest in telehealth is just particularly near and dear to my heart. 
And I joke every time that I am an unapologetic telehealth evangelist. So, you know, it really is my hope that at the end of this session or perhaps this series, you know, you too will leave with a passion for this work and want to just continue it and, and offer it to your clients. Um, perhaps even beyond those times when we are compelled to by the world's difficult circumstances, but instead connecting to this work as a tool that may meaningfully remain in our practices, you know, for the long run. Okay, so we have lots to talk about tonight. Now, you know, in some of the prior installations of this series, we've spoken about themes that are certainly central to the topic of emergency management, excuse me, oh, of risk management. Oh, I had a Freudian slip. Indeed, we had an entire session that was focused on emergency management. We've had entire sessions talking about, you know, uh, selecting good technology products. We've had entire sessions talking about preparing our offices. So for tonight, you know, my hope is to pick up all those other nuts and bolts and some of those areas that I see most frequently causing provider risk management issues. And, you know, of course, there is the aspect where we're being thoughtful about our own practice practices and our own well-being and our own risk management, but then ultimately, I think this is a direct reflection of the security, privacy, and confidentiality that we're offering to our clients. So, you know, I'm, I'm of the mind that risk management is good for goose and gander. Tonight, we're going to talk about themes of documentation, the technology products you use, and not just video conferencing. We're going to be thinking about those other technologies that we're using um, in between sessions to support our sessions and how we can use them in risk managed ways. Some of the most common threats to privacy, security, confidentiality. Interjurisdictional practice, that is when we practice outside of our licensure jurisdiction, and insurance. And we're going to dig in a little bit to some of the specifics and the nitty gritty of billing telehealth insurance. So as always, we'll spend the next two hours dividing our time between didactic lecture. And so you don't have to drone, hear my droning voice, you know, for too many hours, we'll have some breaks. Uh, at three times, we'll stop and do some live Q&A. So please, if a question occurs to you as I'm speaking, go ahead and enter it in that chat box. We will get to it um, as best we can. I should note that we can't promise we get to every question, but I think we do a decent job. If for whatever reason your question is not answered or not answered to your satisfaction, please feel free to send me an email at nwattctelehealth at gmail.com. That's an email that I will be watching and I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions. We'll have some video demonstrations to review some of the concepts that we'll talk about tonight. And then of course, we'll conclude with one final live Q&A and an opportunity to say goodbye because gosh, after 12 hours together, I feel like I know some of you. Disclaimers, I always like to mention whenever you do a technology presentation, something goes sideways with the technology. You know, I'm really here to offer you my best practice recommendations based on clinical work, literature review, and regulatory experience, and really offering what I think some best practices are in this developing area. That being said, inevitably, something will go wrong with the technology. Please don't let it deeply infect your view of telehealth. It just seems to be the way it goes. Uh, always, of course, review your jurisdictional regulations, your licensure board regulations. If you have legal counsel who you contact or a risk manager who you're in contact, perhaps through your mal malpractice insurance, you know, these are always great resources to make sure that your telehealth practice fits within the rules of the area you live. And I always like to know that I'm not offering legal advice nor clinical advice, you know just offering my best bets from my review of the literature, my anecdotal experience, and my uh, experience working in policy and regulation. Um, I'd like to disclose conflicts that could uh, come into play. And you know those include themes like I offer telehealth training in my professional life. So I suppose if everyone goes out and becomes, you know, um, a wonderful acolyte of telehealth, I could have a positive financial impact for me. Although I'd like to point out if we all become very good at it, you know, if I do my job well, um, I'll be out of a job. And in fact, I'd be very okay with that because ultimately, as I was saying to David before we began tonight, I really think of telehealth as, um, I hope it becomes anachronistic at some point in the future. I hope at some point in the future, we think of this as yet another way that you deliver the excellent care that you've always delivered to your clients. You know, I joke that nobody's a telephone specialist. You know, nobody's offering specific consultation just on how to use that telephone talking to clients. You know, so too, I hope we begin to think similarly of telehealth a series of tools that we can use to expand care. And this is, again, where I'm a known telehealth evangelist. I really believe in this, um, this modality's opportunity to bring good care and democratize good care. 
So in order, we're going to spend some time reviewing operational definitions. We're going to review some of the themes very briefly that we've talked about in prior classes, only because if you were joining us for the first time tonight, there's some core concepts that we're making some assumptions that folks already know. We're going to talk about documentation to manage risks and get into some of the nitty gritty of how, what that might specifically look like, how to manage some of the supporting technologies that we use to communicate with clients, in between sessions, thinking a little bit about when is it telehealth versus when is it just an administrative contact, Co thinking about common privacy, confidentiality, and security risks, practice across jurisdictions, insurance, and of course, as we always do, how this all relates to our current circumstances uh, in managing uh, COVID-19 and our jurisdictional closures, particularly as our states open up, thinking about how all of this comes together. Always, we're trying to provide some brief review of themes we've spoken about previously with a deep dive into new material. So my hope is that we can make sure that if you have any questions that aren't covered by our review, you know, perhaps it can be questions that are addressed during our Q&A period, or if it's requiring a little bit more information, you know, we'll direct you to those prior classes available on demand. Okay, very briefly, let's talk about some definitions and examples. So telemental health, you'll hear me refer to it as TMH, the provision of any mental health services using any telecommunication technologies. Um, you know, often when folks say this, I find it to be a term that connotes very little because this can refer to telephone and fax and email and text and video conferencing and really such a diversity of applications that it almost to me means nothing. And when most folks say it, they're saying video conferencing, occasionally they're saying telephone. But today in particular, we're going to expand beyond that and really think about the question of when in my clinical practice am I calling it clinical practice and when is it not? Um, I think it's a distinction that is really important for us to be thoughtful about and to document and decide, you know, before we ever start a telehealth client optimally. And if we've already started, that's great too. You know, we'll think about it moving forward. HIPAA, of course, that Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, that federal regulation that ensures that we are keeping information private and secure. And of course, the information we're talking about is protected health information, PHI. I also like to draw attention to the fact that there is such a thing as ePHI, electronic PHI. And again, I, I found this really surprising as I started getting, um, started working in telehealth, some of the, the information that gets captured into PHI. You know, I'd always thought of social security numbers and addresses and things like that. That seemed obviously PHI to me. But someone's IP address, a device or serial number, um, a license number on software that to me had not occurred to me but indeed you know because this can directly connect someone to their identity you know can be categorized as PHI and is categorized by PHI by HIPAA. Business Associates Agreement you'll hear me reference this this evening this is a contract between HIPAA covered entities, that's us, and our HIPAA business associates, that's the companies we partner with. This is used to protect personal health information, that PHI, in accordance with those HIPAA guidelines. Basically, this contract tells us that the company who we are partnering with will respect those HIPAA rules just as we have to, and that by partnering with them, we are not increasing risk exposure for our clients. So I really think of the BAA as a gold standard in terms of risk management. It is a document that really lets me know I am partnering with someone who is as concerned about risk management as I am. I like to spend a little bit of time thinking about definitions of confidentiality versus privacy. Privacy, the condition or state of being free from public attention to intrusion into or interference with one's acts or decision. So, you know, patient treatment is not public information. We are to keep it private, according to HIPAA. And so, too, in our use of technology, we are to ensure that this information remains private. Somewhat differently, confidentiality means the principle. This is the principle that data or information is not made available or disclosed to unauthorized persons or processes. So basically information is not released without explicit permission. And I think the difference, you know, I think one is more of an active process and one feels a bit more of a passive process to me. I always think of it in these terms. And I wanna distinguish this from security, administrative, physical and technical safeguards related to information, um, often software systems. I mean, security can be a padlock, you know, that is placed on our cabinets. But basically, this is how our patient data is protected, how we will prioritize. Um, and of course, 
uh, maintain confidentiality and privacy. Okay, we've gone through our operational definitions for one last time. We're gonna do a brief synopsis of some of the themes that were previously touched upon. We're gonna give this pretty darn short shrift, but these are the themes that I'm assuming we're all starting from this place foundationally. So I'm assuming that if we are moving forward with video conferencing or telephone appointments, that we are using products that are designed for healthcare, particularly salient for video, um, and that offer us that BAA, that we have our clients complete a signed informed consent document that includes an emergency plan regarding how we will manage remote emergencies. And we've documented all of this in the chart. And again, if this is news or you know, if you would like further information, those prior on-demand classes will dig very deeply into these themes. I'm assuming that we have assessed the appropriateness of the client for the telehealth modality that we have thought a little bit about what our jurisdiction permits in terms of um, what is, you know, it, how much telehealth is allowed, are there specific considerations. For example, some states um, have a requirement that most have waived at this point, but previously required us to meet in person for the first appointment before delivering uh, telehealth care. I'm happy to say that most uh, have waived that under the current context of coronavirus. Um, however, these are the types of things we want to check and that we've given some time and some thoughtfulness to preparing our office and ensuring that uh, it is appropriate to deliver telehealth. I'm assuming that we thought through what services we're providing and to who, that we thought through how we're going to share information with our clients, how we're gonna communicate between sessions, how we're gonna collect payments, and how we are generally going to handle things like scheduling and cancellations, all those administrative details that often are handled in person, um, now we have to do remotely. So I'm assuming as we're speaking tonight that we have a plan for all of this. We've spoken at length previously about our physical office locations as well as the locations where our clients are seeing us, but I also like to frame it today in terms of existential considerations. So, you know, thinking a little bit um, about where is your office? Yes, we've reviewed those office, physical office recommendations and we're assuming that, but tonight we're also asking the question, you know, conceptually, where is your office? You know, my office isn't in my car as I'm driving from point A to point B. My office isn't in, you know, the park as my kiddo is playing on, you know, the, the well, I guess they're not playing on anything these days because of COVID, but previously she would be playing on the monkey bars. You know, it's not in the grocery store when I've ducked in just for an item. I think really for me, the, one of the challenges of telehealth is it degrades some of the boundaries. And, and I say this with the, like, the best of intentions in my heart in that I may see a client calling me and this is someone I wanna connect with. The call might be important. And if I'm with my family in the middle of dinner in a crowded restaurant where we could be overheard, you know, this isn't where my office is. And so in these circumstances, I'm going to be letting it ring. And it is so hard. And I wish I could tell you that I've never run out of a situation where my family is to hide in my car and call that good enough because it absolutely has happened. But generally speaking, as an existential question, I will encourage us all to ask, you know, where is my office? And, you know, as we work from our home offices, as we have been expansive in these definitions, really thinking this more as a question of, can I manage risk in this environment? Okay, on to some of the new and interesting materials. Let's talk about the new stuff. Okay, I think documentation is one of those things that really, this is, I, I include it first for a very, you know, a very central reason that I think this is one of our best practices for risk management. Documenting why we make thoughtful decisions is incredibly important. And I can tell you in, in my experience of working um, with folks, and mostly what I'm talking about is licensure boards, when they have had a telehealth related complaint and they've called in someone to talk about it from a content expertise side, um, I am always impressed by the thoughtfulness that goes into the review, and I am impressed, I'm impressed by the manner in which licensure boards care about why. Why did this person make this decision? If I have a complaint against me regarding my use of technology, and I come in and say, well, I don't know why I did it, um, I encounter that people have very different outcomes in that circumstance versus when they can provide documentation that they made at the time, you know, reviewing their understanding of the risks and benefits of their decision, and they lay out their reasoning as to why they did this. Generally speaking, I find that licensure boards very much care about 
are acting in the best interests of our clients, are doing our best, and are investing time and thoughtfulness into understanding the rules. So to me, documentation really protects us meaningfully in showing that we have been thoughtful, that we have um, that we have taken the time. And you know, for me, it's also a forcing function. If I know I have to document why I've done something, well, I can't write down on that document because I felt like it. You know, I have to write down the reasons and I have to do my homework. So I feel that good documentation also helps me practice in a way that I feel good about and that, you know, frankly, is a forcing function to make me go out and, and do the work and, and understand what I need to understand to manage my risk well. So when I'm talking about documentation, very specifically, I'm referring to that appropriateness assessment. And again, in prior classes, we review um, some of the options that are out there and how one might go about this, some of the common features and characteristics. But I'm, for tonight, I'm just going to say it like this. We're talking about appropriateness assessment. We're talking about that informed consent document. And recall that we're talking about a telehealth-specific consent. So many of us may have an existing consent document from when we initiated care with the client, but if this is an existing client, we're having to transition to telehealth, we are actually required to have a specific telehealth consent. And indeed, it is the recommendation of many professional organizations that as we transition out of telehealth, we again get a new informed consent document, this time asking clients to indicate that they understand the risks of returning to in-person care in the era of COVID-19. And, you know, again, I've mentioned this in prior classes, but I will say that I think the American Psychological Association, as well as the American Insurance Trust, both have really nice free templates for all of these different consent forms. If you're interested in them, I'd encourage you to give them a look. It's nice because we know that attorneys have vetted those, and I always want a healthcare attorney looking at my documentation. Um, excuse me, my documentation templates. Obviously, I'm not having them review every note, but I want them for those templates that I use again and again and again. I want some legal review. So I like these professional organizations templates because they've been vetted by the highest standards of the profession, and I know an attorney has looked at them. Of course, I'm always talking about emergency planning and making sure that emergency plan document is in the medical chart. So again, it, you know, I should clarify, it is not merely that I write these documents, but I include them as part of the client's chart. So that's part of that medical record, that immutable record, that should there ever be a concern related to their care, I will have access to um, and will be part of any consideration if there is a complaint or a review. You know, some things I think people find surprising when I'm talking about documentation. Emails. I generally regard emails that folks send me as part of the medical record. Um, this is kind of a controversial one, and I know there are some folks who would say, come on, give me a break. If someone sends me a quick email from their iPhone that says running five minutes late, do you want me to copy and paste that into the chart? You know, and this is a personal choice as to how we want to practice all of these. You know, we're thinking about risk management. All of these issues are really, they're not categorical. They're continuously distributed, right? I mean, we're going to have to make some choices, you know, in terms of our risk benefit um, analysis. So some folks I know would say, absolutely, I put every single email the client sends me in the chart. Others will say, well, you know, if I think there's clinical content in there, if I think it's salient to treatment, um, I'll put it in the chart. I'll mention my own sort of practice is that I question that sometimes I think something's not clinically relevant. You know, someone says, sends me an email, says five minutes late. Well, after the 10th one I've received, I start to think, hmm, this might be a pattern of avoidance that has clinical relevance. You know, and if I hadn't documented that, you know, maybe I don't recall it as well. Hopefully I document arrival time in my notes, but you know, maybe I didn't. So I think I don't always feel entirely comfortable discerning in real time what's going to have clinical salience in the long run. And this is one of the reasons that I like to use a secure messaging product um, in lieu of just email. I mean, there's many reasons. I think they're more secure generally. But in this case, the messages are automatically integrated into my client's medical record. So I really appreciate that because now I'm not having to copy and paste anything. This is done automatically. And for me, it feels like a more risk managed way to be communicating with my clients for several reasons. One, you know, I'm not using an unsecured email that um, does not comply with HIPAA. And two, and again, I want to acknowledge that in the current context, the Office of Civil Rights and Department of Health and Human Services has made announcements being a bit more permissive with HIPAA, as we've talked about in previous classes. Nonetheless, I really am an advocate for sticking to our highest standards that we can reasonably. And to me, you know, an integrated secure messaging program is a nice way to do that. Telephone calls between sessions. 
this is another one I find hard, um, but this is something I do in my own practice. I always document them. I include them as part of the medical record. You know, is it telehealth? And we're going to talk about this later. Again, I have a hard time telling you in real time. Now I know if someone is calling me with a clinical emergency in between sessions, I feel really confident that's clinically salient and that needs to go in the record. You know, someone calls and says, what was that book you wanted me to read again? You know, again, it might not be, and it might. So generally speaking, I document telephone calls that occur in between sessions. You know, I will admit sometimes someone has called me and said, you know, what was that book again? And I'm not running off to put it in the record. But generally speaking, if I recall to do it, I, I like to, and I think it's a good practice. Notation to indicate um, that the session occurs over telehealth. So I actually have a standard blurb I copy and paste into every single note that I write that says this session occurred via telehealth, by secure video conferencing. I reviewed the risks and the benefits with the client. We confirmed the client could hear and see me. We confirmed that they were alone in the room and could not be overheard. It's a little cumbersome. It's actually just a little blurb that I copy and paste um, and I make sure I do these things as well. Um, but again, you know, were there a concern in the future? I have documented that I am observing a high level of practice and I think that that is valuable if there is some sort of risk or some sort of concern in the future, having invested that time, um, I think pays dividends forward. So this is tiny, and I will be so impressed if anyone has adequate eyesight to see it. But whereas you will receive you know, a PDF uh, handout of these slides, I wanted to make sure that I had some of these documents in this presentation. So once more, this is my own telehealth appropriateness assessment. I wanna be clear, this isn't a product endorsed by NWATTC or any other entity. This is just something of my own making that I use in my practice that I feel leans heavily into what the literature suggests we ask about, but I offer it to you in case it's useful and you can have a copy moving forward. So two, I wanted to give you a copy of my emergency plan. Again, if you attend prior classes, you'll already have this in your slides, but goes over those basic pieces of information, the client's name, the client's whereabouts, if we're going to identify a support person who could help in case of emergency, um, you know, offers a consent to contact that person. I'll mention I actually do get a separate release of information for the support person, just because I'm a stickler for my documentation. Um, and that goes over some of the high level notes of what the client can expect in case of emergency. Okay, so, you know, really, if you take nothing else away, I think just be a stickler about your documentation. I, and honestly, I think this might be a controversial statement. I think there's a lot of technophobia that goes on. I think, um, as, as we talked about in prior classes, there is real research that patients incorporate telehealth with a lot more ease um, and enthusiasm than providers. It's, it's more challenging to get us on board and there's lots of reasons. It's, we're working so hard. It is so much additional work to be on in this sort of performative way in our sessions. You know, it is hard to constantly be asking for all that behavioral observational data that we cannot see secondary to the milieu. It's fatiguing, you know, and I think that to me, this comes into play where I've seen instances where someone's had a board complaint and you know it's related to telehealth and someone on the board has said, well, why were they doing telehealth anyway? Isn't that weird and shouldn't we not be doing that? I'd like to think in the current context with COVID-19 that is going to overcome a lot of that. I think a lot of folks who, you know, unfortunately maybe never would have wanted telehealth in their practice have been forced to and I, I hate to see that, but I also think it is going to democratize um, meaningfully this modality. So it's my hope that some of this will be changing, but I do want to acknowledge that there is technophobia out there and that people are um, predisposed to think bad things about telehealth and telehealth modalities. So again, the more we can document that we're one of the good guys, you know, that we're thinking about this, that we are, you know, on top of it, that we're thoughtful, um, I think it is a valuable investment. So let's talk about some of the technologies that we are using, you know, outside of just video conferencing. Um, but you know, I think the thing I really hope folks take away is that we don't know, we don't have to know every single specific thing about these technologies. We never could, you know, we're going to speak in generalities tonight, and I think that that is a really strong start because even though we are, you know, mental health providers, we are substance abuse. Uh, treatment providers, we are not necessarily technologists, and yet we are held accountable to the technology's performance, and I find that to be something of a rub. So, you know, the more we can think about what are the general things we're looking for, the more we can invest in products and companies 
who we know observe the highest standards around HIPAA and other federal regulations for healthcare, I think we can avoid having to you know, drive outside our lane. We can stay within our scope and not necessarily become technology experts, but instead become good risk managers who make smart partnerships. So briefly, in review for video conferencing, of course, this to many people is synonymous with telemental health. We're gonna choose products designed for healthcare. And again, I'll mention that we now are permitted to use those non-public facing options, your FaceTimes, your Skypes, your Zooms. We have had permissions from the federal government. I'll still tell you, I like a product for healthcare. I do wonder you know, what happens if we get a board complaint and we are in a situation where we're having to manage risk. Um, that board complaint won't come from the federal government. You know, I think it was uh, Mike Pence's office that made it. No, excuse me, it was DHHS and OCR, but I think he was very verbal in, in promoting that announcement. Excuse me, that was misstated. Um, I don't think that office is going to be the one that gives this complaint. You know, it's going to be our regional, um, it's going to be our regional uh, licensure board. So, you know, I think the the more we can stick to products designed for healthcare, we can use a product that gives us that BAA that we choose a product that is easy to use, has good technical support, and has the type of features that we need for our practice. Often I'm talking about things like self-view, we can see what the client can see, the ability to talk to more than one person at a time, multi-caller is called, as well as screen share. We can throw information up on the screen and let the client see that. Record yourself, there's no proxy for it. <laughs> I think it's a great risk managing management tool in terms of knowing exactly what your clients are in for. Um, but tonight, I don't wanna to talk so much about video conferencing. I'd like us to be talking about other telehealth technologies because we've really been very video conferencing heavy in the prior five installations. So I'd like us to talk a little bit about telephone, both landline and mobile devices, emails, and the fax machine. My daughter saw a fax machine the other day and she asked me, what is that thing? And I tried to explain it to her and she just could not understand why a person would need that. She said, just send an email. I said, oh, good point. Okay. And always, you know, we, we talk about these technologies. These technologies progressed. So, you know, next week there'll be something new and interesting. Um, here's Captain Picard saying, I'm calling you for my new Android smartphone. It even has unlimited data. And if you're as much of a nerd as I am, you like a good Star Trek joke. Um, I also just like that there's a ye old timey telephone inside of an Android. It's just wonderfully 90s. I suppose my point here is that these things quickly become dated. So, you know, we're gonna talk about these technologies with an understanding that we're trying to develop a flexible framework to make these decisions moving forward rather than determining the goodness or badness of a single technology. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about telephone, mobile devices, and voice over internet protocol. I think I was amazed that over half of American homes have landlines. Um, I would have thought it was far fewer, but that's the most recent statistic I found. Um, and I actually, my home very recently has a landline that I'm prepared for zombie apocalypse if need be. Uh, I will mention that landlines, HIPAA does not prohibit our use of it for either clinical care, administrative care, you know, so forth. Um, and that we are, you know, we think of the bill, that's going to be our one area that we want to think of as a PHI document, because those bills will often these days have people's telephone number, which we know is PHI. And because of the sophistication of caller ID, many uh, telephone bills these days will have the caller's name printed next to it. I was involved in one case wherein someone's spouse um, thought their partner was up to something and took their telephone bill. This person happened to use one device with multiple lines, a line for their private uh, world and a line for their professional world. It all came in on one bill. And their spouse took that bill, saw multiple calls from one person and called the person to, you know, basically accuse them of inappropriate relationship with their spouse. Um, and in fact, this was someone who had had an emergency and the, the multiple calls was their clinician trying to help them through a pretty significantly difficult time. You know, and of course, this went wrong and resulted in a board complaint. And that's uh, why we're talking about it, you know. So from a risk management standpoint, this practitioner would have done well to treat that bill as a PHI document. Now, I want to acknowledge that, you know, their spouse is being an incredibly bad actor and it is impossible to protect, you know, against, you know, ill intent. And I would say aloud that keep that bill as a PHI document. Okay, 
Um, you know, our concerns about landlines are different than other versions of telephone. You know, there's fewer concerns regarding user location. So if I call you on your landline telephone and you answer and we're about to have a telephone session, I know you are within the correct jurisdiction. Now, some point, some folks will point out we, we have call forwarding and there are other things, you know, so that is true. But generally speaking, you know, I think that if we're calling someone on their landline phone and they pick up it's reasonable to assume they're in their home. And that has a lot of salience for telehealth because we're thinking about where they're located, where we respond to emergencies and so forth. Most um, landlines have fewer compared to mobile devices, interactions with recording and transcription, though some do. Um, I think that this is a great service in terms of accessibility for users of telephones and an incredibly problematic service for users of telehealth because always, you know, we don't want our sessions recorded. We don't want to be offered transcriptions. And yet, you know, that is often um, something we find more on mobile devices. It can be on landlines. But I also want to note that landlines are not invulnerable to interception. I remember back, way back in the day, you know, we taught when we were talking about is it appropriate to be having clinical sessions over mobile devices. So that dates me a little bit. Um, you know, it was really trotted out like landlines would be a much more secure option. You know, and I, I actually used to have a slide about um, how you can tap a landline and then someone pointed out to me it was incredibly antisocial to have my presentation, so I took it out. However, I will tell you, it's not hard. You know, we could all, I was gonna say go to Radio Shack, but they don't exist anymore, but we could go to some store, a Best Buy. Nope, not either. Some store that would offer us technical devices and if through a very simple purchase, it is actually incredibly easy to intercept. Um, landlines. So it is not that they are that technologically secure, um, it is just that practically speaking there are very few problems reported in terms of information security and confidentiality. You know it is I think notable that someone else in a home can pick up on a landline call and so if someone, if, particularly if we are in our home offices in the context of COVID-19, delivering telephone care and we are opting to use our home landlines, I think that there is more, that is more problematic for home-based environments um, because other people can pick up the phone, other people can accidentally pick up the phone and overhear. But generally speaking, you know, we're using landlines for administrative contacts, for clinical contacts, and there's relatively few problems reported. Mobile devices, of course, are sort of the natural companion when we're talking about landlines, and it's just incredibly widespread. Most people in these United States have a mobile device at this point. And of course, I don't want to diminish um, and acknowledge the disparities that occur where not everyone has one. But I think it's really, for me, it's an exciting thing to think about because as this is more and more the case, you know, we know that this is a way that people can receive their telehealth. So if you have a mobile device, you have access to, you know, high quality healthcare. And I think that's an incredibly exciting concept. Um, you know, we all know that we're using our mobile devices way too much and for all kinds of things like socialization, decision making, fighting with one's loved ones regarding what information is correct. Um, you know, we see a lot happening in this space independent of therapies. You know, we see behaviorally oriented apps for weight loss and for smoking cessation and for, you know, I, I, I personally love the chart, um, the app sticker chart, which is for behavioral health changes where you can really give yourself a nice sticker. Um, but we know that there are, there are lots being developed in the space and we see it um, emerging as a complement to therapy. So PTSD coach, PE coach, I have some great relapse prevention apps that I really like that help with plan. In prior sessions, we've talked about My3 and Hope Chest and some other great virtual Hope Chest, excuse me, some other great mobile apps that help us um, help clients in between sessions. Here's a nice picture of mobile devices in case you have forgotten what they looked like. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, we have these really distinct concerns when we are delivering care over a mobile device versus a landline. Of course, the, the number one being location. Our clients can be anywhere. And I don't know about you guys, I've certainly had the, the uh, experience where I have initiated a contact with a client, believing them to be in one place as we, you know, carry on with our session or and I explicitly ask where they are, I learned that they are elsewhere. Or I, even, I have even had folks answer one way. I've asked, are you alone? You know, are you home? And they say, yes, absolutely. And then another truth comes out. You know, I hear kids fighting in the back seat because I'm on Bluetooth in their car as they drive to the donut shop. I mean, these things happen. So I think that, you know, those are, that's gonna be one of our biggest concerns if we're delivering care over mobile devices and one of our special considerations as we're managing our risk. Um, 
I think, we're, and let me be clear, we're talking about both voice over our mobile devices and video, because increasingly, I think there's a blurred distinction. It used to be, in my mind's eye, that I was really only having telephone calls with my clients between sessions. So if they wanted to ask about, you know, when is my appointment again, or what book am I supposed to read, and so on and so forth, and this was a, a voice call. Now, however, particularly with my younger clients, it's not uncommon that they'll try to FaceTime me or they will try to make a video call with me. I'll mention that I don't like doing this and it's actually in my informed consent document that I'm going to um, accept it as voice only. And I'll be honest, the only reason I do it is risk management, the only reason. Because I want to be using products that are designed for healthcare and because I know that if there was a complaint made that they would treat a video contact as somehow more telehealth. And again, we'll talk about it. I think that's a dubious distinction, but I'm also aware that that is how it could be perceived. So my own practice is I do just voice calls in between sessions. I have video calls you know, during sessions. I also think there's something nicely boundaried about that, that we're saving video is somehow special, you know, for our clinical time together. But anyway, when we're talking about mobile devices, we're talking about both voice and video. Of course, in both instances, location are a concern. Um, again, we have more interaction with themes like recording and transcription. It's more easily done that a session could be recorded, which you know brings up very unique issues around privacy, confidential security. I, but I think the the most um, the most likely uh, point of interception and risk management problems in my mind's eye is volume and where someone is when they're speaking. I don't know about you, but I've had many instances in my life where I feel very involved in someone's telephone call out in a public space. They are speaking very loud. They have their telephone turned up you know, very high where I can hear everything one person's saying. I can hear all their responses. And like it or not, I'm really in the midst of the action. You know, So I think that this becomes incredibly problematic when we're thinking about uh, clients being mobile, you know, being outside a secured space, and now they're speaking loud. I think that you know, we, we have some challenges to our privacy, confidentiality, and security. So from a risk management standpoint, um, it is why I like to make sure that people are alone, cannot be overheard, because I think that inherent to the modality of mobile devices, you know, if they talk loud or if they turn the phone up, you know, there, there goes their privacy. Okay. So, you know, when we're using these mobile devices for care, if we are, you know, talking to clients on our mobile devices, if we're having sessions on our mobile devices, we want to make sure that we're password protecting them, that we're treating this hardware, you know, like a tool that handles PHI because it is. We want to think about where data is stored. Many of us have cloud backups on our phones, and some of those clouds are HIPAA compliant and will offer you a BAA, and many don't. So generally speaking, if there's any client information on our phone, um, we want to make sure that it is stored locally. And I'll tell you, my solution to this is I just don't store client information on my phone. I don't store my clients' names and numbers on my phone because I know that gets backed up to Apple's cloud. I don't really want to chase down trying to get a BAA from Apple. I do hear it's possible, you know, with an additional fee. Um, but to me, I just don't do that. I keep all my clients' information in the record. And if I need their phone number, it's a little bit cumbersome. I go look it up. But that way, I know it's more secure. Um, and of course, lock those devices. There is nothing my young daughter would like more than to have unfettered access to my phone. Um, and in many ways, it would make my life easier to generally give it to her and not parent well, but also, you know, to let her have my passwords because she could help me and do things for me. Um, and I don't do that because if my daughter were on my phone playing a game, watching a show and a call came in and just by accident, you know, she brushed it, she could end up having a conversation with one of my clients. And it's just not something that I want to have in my practice. So I'll, I'll say I keep these worlds really separate. I know some providers elect to have a distinct and separate mobile device that they uh, keep, you know, absolutely apart and that they don't share with anyone else. Um, I think it's a good reason for me not to have to surrender my phone to anyone, but you know, everyone can choose what makes sense for them. Okay. When we have mobile devices, we want to be thoughtful about uh, analysis of data. You know, again, they are oftentimes looking at information. They are they are monitoring use and um, flows, particularly in the context of COVID. I read a great deal about you know they're they're watching traffic. This isn't something that HIPAA prohibits. It is something that I like to think about, particularly if you're using voice over internet protocol. We'll, we'll talk about this in a moment. Um, you know, mobile devices can interact so easily with other forms of analysis, 
So I'm thinking about social media applications. I'm thinking about GPS applications. Um, online interactions we can have pretty easily. We'll talk about one of the, a case that I was on in a little bit. But again, you know, they're not just for voice and for phone. We're using them for other things as well. And again, I want to be really thoughtful about keeping everything that has to do with healthcare that I'm delivering to someone very siloed. And I want to make sure that I'm not having them drop GPS tags and sending them to me. I, I just think that I, I try to keep this very separate. Um, I had lots of folks ask me about the NSA. You know, this was more topical when like, you know, Snowden was in the news. And you know, do I think people are listening in on the calls and is that a HIPAA concern? And, and I, I will say, I, I'm unaware of any specific complaints, you know, having to do with NSA and HIPAA. And I think for me, the far greater threat to privacy in, in mobile calls is loud talking, you know, versus the NSA. But, you know, it's, it's viable and it's a real concern. So that being said, I'm not sure how we overcome it. Um, so it's really, Anything is possible, but I think more of what is being done is, you know, more loud talking than phone taps, in my opinion. Okay, so let's do a little bit of demonstration about using uh, mobile in delivery of care. Let's talk for a moment about using our mobile devices delivering care, either as providers or receiving care through mobile devices. Now, folks have often asked me, what do I think of using a mobile device to conduct telemental health, either as provider or patient? Mobile devices have a lot of benefits, right? They are, as we've discussed just moments ago, widely disseminated in these United States and a pretty solid way in which we could improve care access. Now I'm going to describe why I, why I sort of have a beef against them. As you may notice, this is pretty wobbly wiggly, so it's very hard for folks to keep it steady. I'm going to say that I find this even more pronounced um, among young folks who are accustomed to FaceTiming with friends and they're just accustomed to carrying along their mobile device. Uh, I personally find it a little nauseating and disorienting and, and more challenging to delivering clinical care. Now, of course, I could set myself down. Oh. That's much better. However, here again, I think we see some limitations. It's going to be a more confined and constrained screen. So as we've talked about in prior classes, anytime we're in the telemental health milieu, we are in a somewhat impoverished circumstance when it comes to behavioral observation in terms of seeing the physicality of the other person, noticing those cuticle picking moments, those tapping toe moments. I feel this is even more pronounced when we're using our mobile devices because typically, the camera is oriented in such a way that we're going to capture even a more narrow slice of what is going on. So I think we, we lose out on some of the richness of what we can get when we use a larger uh, format for our camera. And then additionally, it's just pretty darn wiggly. That being said, I want to acknowledge that for some folks, that may be the device that's available to them. And that may be the best option that we have and the way we're going to ensure that we get care. However, as a provider, I'm going to encourage you to look for alternate ways to do this. If you happen to have a desktop computer, a tablet, or a laptop computer, often very inexpensively, we can purchase a camera if there's not one embedded in the device that mounts through a USB port or an HDMI port onto the device itself. And this will give us a broader picture. They couldn't even see me saying broad, it was so narrow. Uh, and allow us to have a richer telemental health environment. Okay, and again, you know, I want to acknowledge if it is what is available, it's great. You know, I think that it's a really valid option. But if you happen to have other options, if your client has other options, then you know, I really encourage us to to go ahead and look at those. Here are some of my favorite behavioral health apps. Um, I really like the the products that come out of here locally in Tacoma, Washington, the National Center for Telehealth and Technology, um, or T2, if we want to hear their Terminator-like name. Um, offer a series of free apps designed initially for veteran communities, but ultimately um, I think has really broad appeal and I actually use them with many, many of my clients. So Breathe to Relax, PE Coach, PTSD Coach, um, all I think are pretty great products. I also want to acknowledge SAMHSA has a great, um, on their website, a great list of mobile apps that support SUD treatment, um, really, really excellent resource. 
Okay. So again, you know, mobile devices, we're using them for telehealth. We're using them for those in-between session, little admin contacts, more problems with information security and significant problems with privacy, um, some problems with confidentiality, you know, simply because of these concerns around location and volume and, you know, making sure folks are in the jurisdiction. So let's talk a little bit about emails. Most of us are emailing these days. You know, I think there's a lot happening in the telehealth space that is using email and text, these asynchronous formats of communication to deliver care. And I see it more in the primary care space than in the behavioral health space, but I think it's really notable. And I think it's where the clinical validity data is just starting to emerge. I think it will be incredibly interesting. I know gosh, probably about a decade ago, I remember being at a conference and somebody standing up and saying, well, what about these email and text companies? And they were basically booed off the stage, more or less, people were really scandalized by this idea that this would be a valid format for telehealth. Um, and it's absolutely where the market is going. You know, I, I think the data will catch up and we'll see what it says, but I think that there's a lot being done in this space right now. So we want to think a little bit about how we're using email. Are we communicating with or about our clients? What content is being communicated? Administrative information, billing information, again, clinical content, you know, back and forth between you and the client. And again, I want to acknowledge, acknowledge that the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Health and Human Services has announced that we are, you know, given a little bit more flexibility with some of these regulations around HIPAA. I, some folks, I, I have interpreted this most to mean video conferencing, which they explicitly cite. I have some colleagues I know feel that um, they're feeling a little bit more permission around the use of email. I do want to acknowledge that I think from a risk management standpoint, again, we're not, we're thinking about risks and benefits. If someone said, hey, you know, in the context of COVID and where I live and the jurisdictional rules, you know, where I deliver care, the only, the only viable option for me is email. I need to exchange information with clients. You know, I, these other options don't work for me. I can't use a secure messaging portal for this reason, or, you know, a fax machine doesn't work for me for that reason email has to be the way to go. Again, that's the type of thing we document. We document and put it in the chart. So it's not that I'm ever saying, you know, don't do it, you can never do it. But generally speaking, you know, we just want to be really thoughtful and we want to document it. Um, I like to really encourage folks to use products that are encrypted and preferably designed for healthcare. I see a lot of folks using free Gmail accounts for their practice. And, you know, I, I think for me, that is a less well risk managed practice in as much as um, these free publicly available emails are great. They really work well, um, tend to be pretty darn user friendly, and they're mining our data. You know, if I send an email to a friend saying, can't wait for your baby shower, you know, the next thing I'm going to see when I open my email is 18 ads for diapers. And this is just how they make their money. And, you know, this is pretty much how it goes. So for me, I like to invest in a product that offers encryption. Um, I, as I said, I use a product that's actually integrated with my electronic medical record because for me, that is the easiest way to make sure that all of those asynchronous communications are included as part of the medical record and I don't have to spend my time copying and pasting. But mostly we just wanna think a little bit about what type of email we're gonna use when we talk to clients. And if we've decided to use one of these free publicly available ones, just document why we're doing that. Okay. So again, comparing our technologies, um, we're using it for administrative information. Many cl clinicians I talk to are saying that they do not like to communicate clinical information over email. They really try to stick to administrative information. I appreciate that ethic. Um, I think it's really challenging. You know, I think once you open the door, uh, you know, things come through it. And so I do think there are significant problems to information security, privacy, and confidentiality in as much as we know if we're using unsecured email that we know that that data is being mined. You know, we know that it is very easy for something to be forwarded, you know, and we know that, um, that, you know, we, it is very hard to ensure that it's only clinical, excuse me, only administrative information that someone sends you. So, you know, I hope the thing we'll take away is email's not necessarily a very secure option. We can consider an encrypted email option improves that. We want to decide what email product we're going to use and apprise patients of the risks in informed consent. I actually have a specific paragraph in my informed consent document that addresses email. And I believe the American Psychological Association and American Insurance Trust templates do as well. 
I'd like to encourage you to think about what content you want to be communicating over email with clients and be prepared to have these assumptions violated. And I like to explicitly talk to folks about how I'm going to respond to information that triggers mandated reporting. I think you have a fairly famous case that happened in California in which a gentleman was a provide, excuse me, was seeing a provider and the provider received an email from someone who said, I am this client's sibling. And I need you to know that my that my sibling has relapsed. My sibling, your client, has relapsed and is going to harm someone. Um, they have indicated that they're going to hurt someone in the public. Now, the clinician thought, well, you know, there was not a specific threat made, and so they felt that this didn't fall within the rubric of their mandated report in their jurisdiction. Additionally, they had never heard of this brother. <laughs> they said, my client has a brother? This is the first time hearing about it. So they felt very uncertain about who they had received this email from, and they elected not to make a report. Ultimately, it turns out this person did have a brother and they did indeed harm someone, um, and the family sued the clinician. I think it came out in the favor of the clinician, but not after a long haul. And I thought it's one of these cases that it's just, I, I really feel for the person because what would I do if I get an email that says, you know, so-and-so is going to harm themselves and I just can't verify where the email came from, is the sender who they say they are, you know, and is the inf information true? So for me, this is something I talk about informed consent. I let folks know that if I get an email or a text or a phone call or something that indicates, you know, something that would trigger my mandated reporting, then I'm going to make the report. <laughs> they should know that, you know, and that when they're engaging in care with me, um, they should be apprised that this is a possible outcome. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to decide if we want to email with clients, and if so, what information. We're going to make an account that is clients only, and we're not going to share the password and log in with anyone. We're going to consider if we even want that account on our mobile device, because I think this is really sticky. Um, it is such a temptuous devil for me to check my work email all the time, which we could talk about what it does to my work-life balance. But then additionally, someone could read over my shoulder that PHI as I'm sitting in a coffee shop, as I'm sitting in a park. So, you know, I like to I like to keep it as separate as possible and make sure, again, where's my office? You know, if I'm reading client email, am I reading somewhere that I know to be private? And I'm going to encourage us to add us a notice, add a notice uh, regarding information security to your actual email signature, that almost compulsory block we see on everybody's work email. I've included a copy of mine here. And again, you'd have to have amazing eyesight to read it, <laughs> but you'll have a copy in that PDF. And I do include my Gmail account here. This is back when I paid for a Gmail for business. These days, if you send me a message there, it's just regular old Gmail, but you'll get me. Okay. So we're going to clearly communicate what we want in our informed consent. We're going to talk about how we're managing that different use and how we're managing mandated reporting. And I want to acknowledge that, you know, there are all these new ways that we're, we're thinking about beyond email, these asynchronous um, modalities that we we're talking about a moment ago. So coaching, primary care, some therapy, and the research is emerging in this area. So, you know, when I'm saying email, I think we could broadly think about asynchronous communications, not in real time communications happening between telehealth providers and telehealth clients. Okay, let's talk about the facts. See, here's a cute cartoon, The Facts of Life, and it has the birds and the bees on it. Stickler for a pun. So, you know, fax machines, they're pretty commonly available. Um, traditionally, fax lines used telephone lines. These days, they are internet enabled, and the technology underlying them, as I understand it, are awfully darn similar to email. So I think in some ways, the distinction between faxes and emails are a little more antiquated. You know, that being said, the, the user interface is incredibly different. It's very hard, I think, to, um, you know, read someone's fax over their shoulder uh, on their mobile device. Although I will say I have a mobile fax. I have a, an electronic fax that goes to my, my mobile device, so it can be done. But most, most faxes these days are still the big bulky machines. One thing I like to mention is that fax machines typically maintain records of everything sent and received and the logs may need to be manually cleared. So if you have a fax machine, it may be worthwhile to check into whether or not anyone has cleared the logs, whether or not that happens automatically. Um, if you wanted to be really antisocial, you know, you could go to somebody's 
fax machine and have them print logs and it would print out copies of everything sent and received, which of course you know, it contains a lot of PHI if you're in a healthcare practice. Okay, so you know, fax machines, I will say from the underlying technology standpoint, not dramatically different from email, and yet, you know, there are far few problems reported with fax machines. It's just one of those things that does not seem to get people into too much hot water. That being said, I really encourage people, don't keep your fax machine in your waiting room. <laughs> this is not a telehealth recommendation per se. Um, it is just the case that I think it's a, a poor practice. I, I went on a few consulting roles where they had, for space constraint reasons, the fax machine really where the patients could have access to them. Um, you know, so an incoming fax could be picked up by the patient. So, the things you encounter. So understand what technology your fax uses. Most likely it uses the internet. Consider where you place that fax machine and, you know, think about where those old faxes go. We want to uh, keep that hardware safe, lock it up, and purge the logs when you can. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of the most common threats to security, privacy, and confidentiality. So we've talked about the different ways in which technology is going to facilitate our telehealth contacts. And again, it's such a broad and diverse group of technologies. It's very difficult to speak to them as one class um, because there are tremendous differences among them. And we are not engineers. You know, we are really here to be thoughtful in, in the broadest of um, ways. So broadly speaking, here are a few of my favorite anecdotes. I think I shared with you the smartphone bill breach. Um, and this was where someone's spouse, you know, proactively went and saw that PHI on their smartphone bill. But I think there are other ones that we want to think about. Um, you know, again, just common practices, easy things to happen that threaten our telehealth sessions, confidence confidentiality, privacy, and security. Um, I had a consultation that I was on in which there was a privacy breach. Uh, a staff member had uh, was working in a mental health practice in Los Angeles, and you know I lived in LA for many years, and it is very exciting to see famous people. It does happen. Now this person was a lovely person. They'd worked in the practice a long time, and they well understood and knew that they would never disclose, you know, having seen someone come into the practice that would be inappropriate. Um, on a break, they were using social media. And earlier that day, they had seen one of their favorite actors come in for psychotherapy. Now, again, they knew better. They wouldn't have disclosed that. But they did just feel the need, I guess, to go on their phone and say, oh, you know, I saw Joe Schmo, the actor, and boy, he's really nice. He's great. So they posted that online. Unfortunately, they, they had also enabled their GPS. And so it dropped a GPS tag that read, you know, Dr. Bob's uh, psychotherapy practice. So now they had, in fact, breached the privacy of this uh, famous person, you know, and placed it in a public forum. It was one of these moments that's just such a, an example of a very easy mistake having a very dire consequence. You know, they had enabled GPS on their social media. That's a very easy button to push, you know, and I don't think it's that unreasonable to be in Los Angeles and say that you saw someone famous. I, I would argue that if you work in a psychotherapy practice, you could do a little better, you know, but it wasn't a un terribly unreasonable thing they did. So, you know, I think as we're thinking about the intersectionality between our private lives and our professional lives, this is another great example of keeping it as separate as possible, particularly when technology is involved. Um, I think another one of my favorite stories about security breach, um, there was, I think, a disgruntled employee uh, left a telemedicine company, actually rather notably, and uh, left a virus that went through and scraped all the email addresses of all the associates um, and all the clients of the telemedicine company. And in one giant email, so everyone saw each other's email addresses, uh, sent some pretty um, untoward content to everyone. And in doing so, you know, revealed the identity of thousands and thousands of clients. And so this is one of those moments where, you know, this was a malicious act. Someone had intentionally brought a virus in to uh, impair the security, um, but it did indeed, you know, turn around and, uh, you know, disclose the PHI of thousands of clients. So it's one of these things that, again, you know, having good practices, good security, I mean, could they have safeguarded against that? I'm not so sure. But, you know, when we have good um, software on our devices that we use for uh, healthcare that manage you know, virus protection, when we have 
um, passwords that protect us. You know, when we are not downloading things willy nilly on the internet on machines that we use, you know, for healthcare, I think these are our best practices that will help manage our risk. And this brings me to the theme of social media and online presence, because I think this is an area that, again, gets very intersectional with, uh, with risk management, even though it may or may not even really have much to do with our professional identities. Now, I want to acknowledge that um, there are some providers who elect to use social media as one platform for advertising, and it's important to differentiate the, the personal and professional uh, media that we have there, you know, essentially that there there would be a Facebook page exam for example, there are Facebook pages that are personal and have our you know goings on and pictures of what we ate for breakfast and whatnot. Um, there are also uh, pages that are entirely dedicated to businesses. Now they have different features associated with them. And I think notably, one can have friends and one cannot. They try to be cognizant of some of the connections. That being said, people can often still like something, they can acknowledge something, they can connect themselves online. So too with Twitter, so too with Instagram. When we put this information out into the public forum, we sort of lose control of it. So I really think if we are going to use social media to advertise our professional practice, we wanna be very thoughtful about what features we enable and the extent to which uh, a person could disclose that they are a client or really impair their own privacy and confidentiality. Um, I also want to acknowledge that these days, there's a lot of our information available online. Our personal and professional information is available online. And to me, this feels like a risk management issue. I really encourage folks to take a moment, Google your own name, fun. You know, can you find where you live? Um, it has been quite a time, and I don't know how successful I've been. I really at one point went on a mission to get myself taken off online directories. At that time, I did work that was very charged, if I'm honest, and intense. Um, and I was not excited about the idea of every client knowing my home address. That was something I was not comfortable with. And so, and yet, even though I had never given permission, many online directories would give someone a map directly to my home. And that made me feel unsafe. So I think, you know, we want to be a little bit thoughtful of what our presence is like online. And I, here I'm speaking very passively, you know, the information that is put up about us without our permission, as well as the information that we put up about ourselves. Uh, I really discourage folks from Googling clients or looking up client information, because I think there's a parallel to be had. I know it's publicly available, and I know that, you know, many of our clients have actually no concerns. If we Google them, they would tell us to have a great time. But I personally like to keep it separate. If I'm seeing a client, you know, for relapse prevention and I Google their name and now I found a picture of them having a beer, I don't know when that picture happened. I don't know, were they, is there actually soda water in that can? You know, I, I don't know what's going on. Do I have to now bring this up to the client? Is it a clinical issue? You know, for me, it crosses boundaries um, and I think impairs trust in a way. I know that there are people who do Google their clients and I respect their, their right to do so. Simultaneously, it's a practice that from a risk management standpoint, I think I'm learning information that may not have been intended for me. And I think it gets a little clinically fuzzy. That's the technical term, fuzzy. Okay, and caveat user. This one's employable due to stupid personal stuff he put on his Facebook page and this lady says me too. And this guy says for me, it was an embarrassing YouTube video. Um, I tell you, the only circumstances that I really like Googling folks is when I used to have trainees in telehealth. I would have folks who would come and do a year-long postdoctoral fellowship in telehealth training. And I really wanted to know what they were up to on social media. How, how much had they taken this to heart? You know, did they really keep their professional and personal lives um, separate? Because I think it was one metric of, you know, how much are they really in that telehealth world and understanding it. If you do elect to have a practice website, um, there are HIPAA requirements that we want to adhere to. So I really like to encourage folks to have a notice of privacy practices or NPP on their website. This is something, you know, you can look up templates, you can Google this, there's lots and lots of options, but you know, let folks know how you're gonna handle pri information privacy. I don't allow people to post on my website. I don't allow them to leave any indication, you know, of who they are, why they were there. For me, I think that creates uh, far too much potential uh, disclosure of PHI. 
Um, we want to make sure that we're not forwarding our client communications, you know, and that we are asking clients not to forward our communication, their communications to us that, and not to reach out to us over social media. Again, keeping these all as separate as possible. I encourage us to limit that easily accessible personal information online, um, maximize all your privacy settings on social media. I know a lot of providers have actually come up with their like secret social media name, you know, where they don't use their legal name as their social media name because they don't want to be um, as easily discovered by some of these directories. And I think that there's some, some, good, uh, some good and reasonable practice to that. And mind your tweets. You know, when you put information out into the world, like such as Twitter is a great example, you know, we run the risk of that being disseminated, retweeted, of uh, losing our context, and, and frankly, losing control of the message. So I know a lot of folks are using social media platforms to disseminate good information about mental health care, about telehealth, and, and other topics. And I think that it is an area for potential risk. So for me, I really try to minimize any footprint I have in a professional capacity on social media, because I just think it is not an environment that is well aligned with the type of risk management that I want for my practice. Now, I, other people can do it other ways, and that's absolutely valid. But when we do that, we just want to really bring, again, a lot of thoughtfulness and some documentation to the process. And all of this is fine and good. And at the end of the day, we have to have our clients doing some of the same things, right? So we really have to help recruit our client into being a good advocate for their own privacy, their own confidentiality. I really try to capture this in informed consent um, and really try to help clients think through themes like using technology properly. You know, so if we have um, an email where they're receiving the links for video conferencing appointments, I wanna make sure that's not an email they share with 10 other people, you know, that they are, um, being thoughtful about securing their Wi-Fi if they are able, that they're using dedicated password protected profiles on the computer and not shared, you know, accounts that someone else could accidentally stumble upon, that they're not forwarding our communications that we're having with them and they're not recording our sessions, you know, when we can't see them doing it. Authenticating identity, always important when we're doing it remotely, a good risk management practice. Uh, as I mentioned in by previous classes, I actually have folks show me their ID and I take a screen grab of it. Um, could it be a fake ID? Yes, it could. I would not say that I would be that sophisticated to know a fake ID when I saw it in person versus online. Um, and I like this little cartoon because day 33, they still suspect nothing. If only they had verified his identity. Okay, let's talk about some of the jurisdictional and regulatory issues because this is such a frequent topic of risk management concerns. we're really thinking about what the minimum requirements for practice are. So this is, this is sort of the floor, not the ceiling. <laughs> and, you know, I think that technology's integration into law is just emerging now. Again, you know, we're providers, we're not attorneys. And this is changing so quickly in the context of COVID-19. There have been myriad executive orders that have been more permissive um, across many jurisdictions when it comes to the use of telehealth. So We want to be mindful that your jurisdictions differ. So what maybe one set of rules in one place is going to differ in another. And you always wanna consult best practice guidelines that are relevant to your jurisdiction. And many of our boards will have opined specifically on the matter of telehealth and on the matter of telehealth in the context of COVID-19. Consider your employment setting policies and procedures. Many of us are being compelled to do telehealth, you know, whether or not we chose to, because that is the policy of the organization where we work. And consider, of course, the federal laws that apply HIPAA and high tech. But what is interjurisdictional telehealth? I mean, basically, this is anytime you're providing care outside of your licensure jurisdiction using technology. So this can be you are in a non licensed jurisdiction delivering care. This can be your client travels outside of your licensed jurisdiction. Really, either one of you goes a, goes a traveling. And this is not an issue exclusive to telehealth. I mean, these, these issues are salient to in-person care as well. If my client you know, goes on vacation to Hawaii and is having a terrible time with his family and calls and wants to have a phone session instead of our in-person usual meetings, you know, technically this would be interjurisdictional telehealth.
So, you know, if I travel to a school across the state border, I live in Washington, Oregon's fairly close, and it's not uncommon that, you know, I know practitioners who are working both sides of the border. Um, if I'm doing video conferencing with a client who is outside my jurisdiction, I've had clients who go to college or, you know, they take a vacation. Or if I receive a telephone call um, to my office from a client in a bordering state, perhaps they usually drive into my office to see me, but in this instance, you know, they are just calling me from their home, which is over the state border. All of these technically would be interjurisdictional practice. And I think what's important to note is that there are no federal licensing laws. Nurses have a compact, which are really impressive. Physicians are typically required to get practice, excuse me, get licensed where they practice and prescribe. Um, one thing I think is fun is that 11 states are not signed on yet to the driver's license compact. So like technically my, dri my Washington driver's license wouldn't work in 11 states. Um, I'm not, I don't think there's a lot of legal precedent for people getting into trouble over this. But you know, it is the case that, you know, we know, I think generally speaking, that we're supposed to deliver care in the jurisdiction where we're licensed. I feel like if you've gone to prior classes, we've definitely thought this through. Where it gets stickier for me is when someone, you know, is crossing the jurisdictional boundaries sort of by accident, they're on vacation, they're on a work trip, you know, they, they live over the border and they drive across the border to receive care. Technically speaking, you know, this falls into the zone of interjurisdictional practice and, and can get us in trouble from a risk management standpoint. So this is my the little cartoon I have for this. As long as there's nothing wrong with me, I'll be heading back to Jir Jupiter. I'm not sure what the jurisdictional rules are on Jupiter. Okay, I, I often hear some common myths that I like to bring up and dispel to a certain extent. I hear that, you know, people say, well, I, I always know that there are 30 days, you, you're allowed to go 30 days anywhere. I could practice into any other jurisdiction 30 days. And while many states do have temporary licensure permissions, it really does vary state by state. I'll hear folks say that all mandated reporting is the same across jurisdictions, and that's absolutely not true. In some states, for example, we are required to report intent to harm. In others, we are required to prize confidentiality over reports. Um, and I've heard folks say, well, the highest degree is you always maintain services no matter what. You know, you never interrupt services because of jurisdictional issues. And again, you know, unfortunately, from a risk management standpoint, that's not the case. You know, it may be the case that we have emergent circumstances or there's an ethical reason that we must continue care. And in that circumstance, we're consulting, we're documenting, we're trying to look up getting temporary permission to where the client is. In most instances, however, you know, if we're in a circumstance where we are delivering care across a jurisdictional boundary, you know, we're delivering care without a license and it can really get us into some hot water. So I think in COVID, this stuff to me just feels all, all the more challenging because we want to think about what the laws of practice are in the other jurisdiction. You know, do they conflict with our home jurisdiction? And, you know, what is their attitude toward technology? Acknowledging that in the context of COVID, most jurisdictions have been more permissive about temporary practice across jurisdictional boundaries, and most have been more permissive about the use of technology. So again, we're going to document why am I crossing a jurisdictional boundary if this is what I need to do. I'm going to document if it's my intention to get licensed in both locations, and I'm going to document my efforts to get temporary permissions. I'm going to make sure that the client is aware of the risks and the conflicts and the differences in reporting authorities. So if I'm in Washington and my client's in Texas, I know they have different mandates regarding who uh, when you report intent to harm. And even if I decided I was going to do this in the long run and I got some sort of licensure, temporary or permanent, into Texas, I would still need to discuss with my client how we were going to handle um, these types of mandated reporting conflicts. I'd need to let them know what I'm going to do if this issue emerges. And I like to have them document that in a signed informed consent document. I like clear documented re resolution, even if you're licensed in both places. And, you know, we're not just talking about mandated reporting. You know, we're thinking about themes of age of consent for services, you know, who gives informed consent for services, records retention requirements, um, and, and others as well. So when it all goes amiss, you know, we always are confirming location at the initiation of our video calls and our telephone calls. That's one of the first things we're going to do. We're going to make sure that the client is where we think they are. And we determine that policy in advance and we document that in informed consent. And we do not, we try as best we can not to deliver routine care interjurisdictionally. We're practicing without a license and that's very problematic. I will acknowledge in my own practice, there have been circumstances that are emergent 
where I prioritize patient care first and I've decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, talk to this person on the telephone. We're going to, we're going to do crisis management. And I'm going to figure out the licensure stuff as my second phone call. But my first phone call, my first obligation is to the client. Hi, Jason. Hello, Dr. Smucker. How are you doing today? Very well. Good. Jason, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, I can. Great. And as we do each time, I'm going to start off confirming that you are at your home on 123 Smith Street in Seattle, Washington. Uh, no, uh, not right now. We're, no, we're I vacant. figured. It, it looked a little different, like you were in a different space, and I thought maybe you were in a different room, but tell me, where are you? Yeah, we're, we're at our vacation home. Oh, that's great. Where's your vacation home? Uh, it's in uh, Hoodport, uh, Oregon. Okay, so you're, you're in Oregon this time and not in Washington State, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, Jason, at this moment, I'm actually going to have us pause. And today, unfortunately, I'm going to have to reschedule our appointment. And I so apologize for doing that. However, as we talked about during the informed consent portion, when we first got started, it was a long time ago, I know, um, I am licensed to practice in the state of Washington. Now, because of some of the rule changes that have occurred um, during COVID-19, I may be able to deliver care to you. Now, how long are you going to be there in Oregon? Uh, about a week. Okay. Well, I think we, we'll have some choices. If you would prefer to wait until you've returned to Washington, that's just fine. You know, if, um, however, you would like to receive your appointment while there, I can do a little bit of homework and learn if I am permitted to deliver care into Oregon. Now, I want to acknowledge, of course, if you were having emergent concerns or there was something where you needed immediate help, I want you to reach out to me regardless of where you are. Well, given that it's only a week, um, I think it's okay to, to just circle back when, when okay. I'm back in town. Well, then why don't we plan on meeting next time um, at, at our usual scheduled time, um, and we'll be back in the same jurisdiction, and it'll all be on the up and up. That makes sense to me. Thank you, Dr. Smucker. Thanks, Jason. Okay. A question I receive frequently is that of international practice. You know, what do we do when a client travels internationally? And, you know, my understanding from speaking to risk managers is, ironically, we actually have fewer problems delivering international care than we even do delivering interjurisdictional care within the same country. And this is largely because there is the question of, does that location regulate the services we're providing? So I've had clients travel to countries where there's no real construct of licensure for psychologists, which is what I am. Um, you know, and I think that that is a little bit less problematic than if they were delivering, I had to deliver care into Idaho, where I absolutely know they have licensure and that you know, there's a different set of rules. You know, I think we're thinking always about risk and benefit and what helps you know, give good health care and protect my client's well-being. I think an important theme will be to ask um, your malpractice carrier and your local board how they would treat a claim or a complaint. Because it is often the position of malpractice carriers that if you are practicing interjurisdictionally, and that can be internationally or within you know, a country, that they will not cover claims. So if you pay for malpractice coverage, you know, one of the lovely features is that if someone brought a claim against you, um, they would help pay for your legal defense, which is a really valuable thing. And if you were, in their eyes, breaking the law, they often won't cover you. And so this is an example of where if we're practicing interjurisdictionally, we could get into hot water in terms of receiving coverage from our malpractice carriers. Okay, our clinical vignettes today will include musical doctors. Um, so today we're gonna talk about Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre uh, has seen a client who is stable following a relapse um, uh, for a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. Um, this client is moving internationally and wants to maintain services with Dr. Dre, and he is deciding whether or not to offer that. So what are some of the considerations we would encourage him to make? One, we'd have him call his malpractice carrier and his board to ensure what their standing would be on this. We would think about the client's history. We would think about their capacity to arrive at an agreed upon plan. Where is the client moving? And is the practice that Dr. Dre serves regulated in that location? 
um, and we would have him document everything really thoroughly, all his good thinking and all his good uh, preparation. Okay, phew. It's, I know I've been talking a long time and I'm eager to hear some questions and um, make sure we give folks a, a little change of pace. Wonderful, Sarah. So I, I'll back up to the previous section where uh, we were talking about some social media. There's a couple of questions that came in about that. Right. So a couple of them are going to go together. Um, what, what in particular, what are your thoughts about looking up people on social media? I really come down on the side of not doing it. Um, there's a wonderful article by a colleague, Karen Lehavot, who wrote about, you know, to Google or not to Google. Um, I think Keely Combs, K-O-L-M-S, um, is also has written extensively on this topic, and I think she's brilliant. So the reason I don't do it, I, I don't do it because I don't want to enter my client's life in that way. It feels a bit multiple relationship-y to me. Um, I feel that they are putting information there. Now, let's acknowledge that they're putting it out into the public forum. You know, if they are making this available publicly, um, you know, I'm not breaking any rules. And, you know, it's not something I like to do from the perspective of, I fear that I'm going to interact with information that wasn't intended for me. You know, the example I like to use is if I'm seeing someone, you know, for treatment and I see them drinking on a picture, you know, what do I want to do with that? Do I challenge them on this? You know, do I have a conversation about it? You know, and this wasn't information they chose to share with me. This was information I went and hunted down. And again, you know, I, I know there are different opinions on this, but I think that's where I put that one. Yeah, and, and so along the same lines, um, one person asked, well, what if it's an emergency? I can't reach them through the normal means. Look them up on social media? Then I probably would. I mean, I'd, I'd look them up any way I could if I couldn't reach them. I, I don't think I would necessarily reach out to them on social media um, because I, hmm, that's a really good question, actually. Would I do it? I don't think I would. Um, but if I was looking for, you know, some capacity to like understand, like to get a, like if I was looking for them on LinkedIn to get their email, you know, or I was looking for um, a phone number or something like that, I would consider doing it that way. Hopefully I'd have their email and phone number because they're my clients. So I don't know what scenario I'm imagining, but I, gosh, I guess the push came to shove and there was no other way I could reach them. I, but I would probably be wellness checking before I'd be social media and maybe that's wrong minded. Um, that's, yeah. excuse me, stumped me. You got me. <laughs> um, but I think that's one that I probably, I wouldn't do it. But I, again, this would be the type of thing, if I did it, I would document it, um, my reasoning for doing it, and I'd put it in the chart. Okay, okay. Well, here's a, a Facebook question. It's kind of a two-part. Um, is it possible to have a personal private Facebook account that is separate from a business account with the same login? If so, does anything from the personal account show up, show in the business account when using the same login with the two attached areas with one as a business and the other one as a private account? Gosh, that's a good question. And, and the real answer is I don't know because I'm not as familiar with the internal functioning of Facebook. I mean, I, I absolutely know it's possible to have um, distinct professional and personal pages. The question is unified login. Um, Typically, when I have had professional pages, like for example, I was uh, chair of the Washington State Psychological Foundation for a while, and I had a professional, you know, page that was WSPF, and then I had my personal page, and you know, there was there was linkage, so you could link back to my personal page. Now, that wouldn't give everyone permissions to see my personal page, but that was visible. I, I will also acknowledge that because it was not a clinical capacity that I was doing this professional work, that I wasn't going really out of my way to obscure, you know, my personal identity. You know, were it me, I'd probably just create two separate entities. The accounts are free. You know, there's not a real downside. So I probably wouldn't just have one login um, because I just don't trust. <laughs> I think when it comes down to it, I don't have a ton of trust for these social media companies and, and their willingness to play by the rules I want them to play by. Right. So, so by having separate logins, separate passwords, you know, maybe the system will keep two things separate, but um, yeah. you got it. You just got, that might be the best way to go. Yeah, that might be. I mean, I, it's worthy of research and I would certainly look into it. I mean, I'm, again, the, the real answer is I don't know. And, you know, Facebook's a bit notorious for changing their privacy practices with sort of not great notification. And so I, I would probably keep them separate. I would. 
Okay. Well, since we're still on the social media, I just want to ask another question here. Yeah. It's a, uh, somebody asks, is, is it ethical to have a therapy blog when you're still practicing as a therapist? Oh, great question. I think it is. I mean, I think, again, it's one of those things I'd be really boundaried about. I would choose a forum, excuse me, a format, not a forum, for my blog that did not lend itself to comment or affiliation. So, you know, I wouldn't want a Tumblr page where people could leave long comments, you know, and say, oh, well, Dr. Swapper was great when she was my therapist. You know, like, I would want to absolutely make sure that nobody could stumble upon it and, you know, disclose anything that I regard as PHI on that page. Um, I don't even like when you can like something because I feel like it suggests a relationship, but I'm, I'm a stickler for these things. So I think, I don't think it's unethical. I would just be really cautious about the format that you're using um, in that it just doesn't lend itself to the sort of social connectivity of things. Okay. Well, backing up just a little bit more, uh, some folks were interested in the Tacoma company you mentioned. What, what was the name for that? Oh, yes, 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 yes. It is a governmental organization. Um, it is part of the Department of Defense, in fact. It is the telehealth, no gosh, the National Center for Telehealth and Technology. Um, you'll often hear it called T2, which again, I think sounds like a Terminator. Yeah, it's interesting. Online, uh, the the website is kind of hard to find, but you can find them on Wikipedia. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they have rebranded themselves recently, but for many years a- ago. They've been <laughs> that was kind of strange. Um, uh, another question, and I, you might have covered it a little bit, but um, do you know of a, a email service that's HIPAA compliant? There are, you know, there are many. I, I use one. Um, so you can, for example, the, the easiest ones are like Google for Business will give you a BAA. Office 365 will give you a BAA. You know, these are commonly available products. I use Office 365. Um, for not any particular reason. I've used Google for Business in the past. Um, That being said, I really do like the products that integrate into our electronic medical records. They just feel easier to me. Actually, I have both. So I have an an encrypted email. If push comes to shove and I need to email someone, I feel a little bit better about that. But the the product I'm really getting my clients to try to use is that product that's integrated into the EMR. Right. Have you heard of Proton? You know, I've heard of it. I've never used it. I'd be interested if folks like it. Okay. Some folks are making a comment that in the chat. Um, This is a little bit different, but uh, what do you do about documenting consent for treatment or medication when the patient doesn't have the ability to send a document back to you or print it to show you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, there, there are workarounds that are technology enabled. So we could use a product like DocuSign, you know, we could have, we could capture an electronic signature. Again, some jurisdictions are persnickety about that, but I find that in COVID they've been more permissive. Um, you know, if we wanted to, so the, the, the risk managers would say that if we absolutely cannot get it done any other way, you know, what we have them do is we go over it verbally and we document in the chart that we reviewed all of these themes. That being said, I'm going to keep trying to get that signed document. I just think it's a good, I think it's good for my protection and theirs. And I like it as a referential point. You know, a a great example would be, I had a lot of clients ask me to get involved in something legal in their lives years after care. And I like the fact that I can point back to my informed consent document and say, hey, when we started, you know, I told you I'm not a forensic psychologist. Of course, they have rights to their legal records and they, excuse me, their medical records and they can use them as they see fit you know, but I'm letting them know that I'm not going to be become an expert witness, you know, for their case, yeah. because it's just not something I'm trained in. And it's, it's some of the limits. Um, so I, I like having that document. I like having it signed. If you can get it, I think it's great. But if you just can't, then review it verbally and document that you did. And I think last time we talked about US mail works pretty good, too. It does. I mean, if they can't print it, you know, I, I hear you. Um, that's tricky. Yeah, I mean, yeah. these days, computers, you can they can sign it with their finger you know, and send yeah. it back on the computer screen so but if that's just if that's just not going to happen you know then we we do it verbally okay and uh folks were interested about the website that you mentioned uh, the consent templates yes the american psychological association that's apa.org and then the american insurance trust which boy i should know their website i'll find it (laughs) thank you (laughs) i work with them a lot i think they're great um and they have some wonderful templates that are free and online okay I think that gets us up to date. Okay, well, let's let's hold forth and finish okay. up here. All right. 
let's talk a little bit about insurance reimbursement. Oh boy. Okay, so you know some assumptions again about fees and billings. We are in advance determining what fees we're going to assess. I want to acknowledge that some folks do charge a surcharge for telehealth services. And you know, this isn't something that I do, uh, it's not something I've really ever done. I also want to acknowledge that there are times at which you know, doing telehealth costs more, you know, because in addition to our physical offices, we may be paying for encrypted email, we may be paying for a video conferencing product that offers a VAA, you know, it may just be interjecting more costs into our professional lives. And so I think it's not unreasonable to assess a telehealth surcharge. I'll also mention, like, it's just not something I do. Um, and we have documented with our clients how we're going to handle things like cancellations and missed appointments and technology interruptions, who will be financially responsible if there's a technology interruption. So we're starting from an assumption that we have talked about all of these themes with our clients. So when we're thinking about the element of insurance, you know, we're going to be thinking about is this a client who is um, going to be paying through their insurance? Am I billing the insurance in order to receive payment? Or is the client paying privately, a private pay client, you know, who may seek to uh, reimburse themselves after the fact, and I may help give them documentation that facilitates that, but fundamentally that financial transaction is occurring directly between client and me. So we want to think about the rules of your jurisdiction. Not every jurisdiction um, requires insurance to cover telehealth. This has been one of the more fascinating, I think, developments in the context of COVID um, that I am seeing many more jurisdictions legally require insurance to reimburse for telehealth and also for them to reimburse with parity, to reimburse at the same rate as in-person services. So this is really quite a coup. You know, here in Washington state, we previously did have legislation that required coverage, but parity is brand new. Now I want to acknowledge that these executive orders are not, you know, regulations um, long-term. They're executive orders that are intended to give us coverage while the state legislature, you know, goes off and makes these things into law if they see fit. So I say this because they will expire at some point. And, you know, at the end of the day, I always encourage folks to check with individual carriers because there are so many sort of blue heron experiences, red herring, not a blue heron. Oh my goodness. There's so many red herring experiences in which there are these outlier um, problems. So for example, I have a client who has an insurer who's based out of state. Yes, they are still beholden to the laws of my jurisdiction where they deliver care, but getting them to recognize that may be a fight. I know here in Seattle, uh, one of the larger insurance panels is having everyone bill, bill their telehealth appointments to insurance frankly, incorrectly. <laughs> and they're doing that because their own systems have not been able to keep pace with the legislative changes. And so instead of, you know, quickly turning around a new system that could reimburse correctly, they're asking people to use billing codes that would be unanticipated um, in order to build their telehealth. And we'll, we'll get into those codes in a moment. But this is a long-winded way of saying, always check with the individual carrier. This is just a rapidly developing area. Um, and I really want folks to think about the rules of their jurisdiction and, and when those rules might change. Because I do think we're gonna be in a circumstance here over the next few months where we began care with a client with one set of rules and the rules are going to change on us. So insurance may have been required to cover appointments when we initiated care and then sometime later they are no longer required to cover it. Um, and I, I'd like to say that I am hopeful that states will adopt these executive orders into law, but I know, for example, in Minnesota just this week, um, an executive order requiring coverage, I believe, expired. And yeah, it's, that's really problematic. If you started delivering care to someone, they're not ready to go back into the office, or maybe you're not ready to go back into the office, but now their insurance won't pay for it. You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle that? So in 2018, there were some updates to how we build synchronous video conferencing into the home. And we're, I'm gonna talk about this and then I'm gonna show you a form. So if one, if you are a auditory learner, you know, let's talk about it now. And if you're a visual learner, just one moment. Um, I think that, you know, the place of service code, that code that determines where uh, the provider is located, so to speak, um, is probably the most notable change in that they actually gave its its own category. And to me, that that is indicia of sort of legitimacy of telemental health coming into 
the mainstream. So, you know, when you do a place of service code these days, and it is a telehealth appointment, we use the code 02. In the old days, you used 11, which is the normal one you use for an office-based visit. There's also a modifier code that we will use in addition to our usual CPT billing codes. In the old days, we used GT for general telehealth, I had a nice sort of acronym. These days we use 95, which again indicates general telehealth. So 0295 as of 2018, that's the right way to do it. And again, some carriers are gonna ask you to do it the old way. You know, so again, you wanna check with those individual carriers as to what they wanna see. But I wanna show you sort of a, Oh, um, and of course we're using the same service codes as usual. So 90791 is the code I use for intakes, 90837 for an hour long therapy session, 90834 for a 45 minute therapy session. So those service codes aren't changed. It's really just the place of service location code and that modifier code that have changed. And again, I wanna acknowledge video conferencing is different than telephone. Telephone has its own unique codes and very often is reimbursed at a lower rate than video conferencing. So on a form, I just want to highlight to you where you would find the, your place of service code and your modifier code. And if, you, if you're old school like me, you have seen these forms, the HICFA, um, I assume that's the acronym for Health Insurance Claim Form. Um, you'll also hear it referred to as a CMS 1500, CMS 1500, Center for Medicare Services 1500, because I think that is the number of the form. So this is what your insurance form looks like, and here is where we would put our different place of service, 02 instead of 11, and our modifier code 95 for telehealth. And again, you will have excellent vision if you can read these little tiny printed boxes, but my hope is that you can enlarge this on a screen, uh, if not now, but later in the PDF format. Okay, so what is next? For me, I am thinking a great deal about themes of ethical abandonment and termination in the context of these executive orders. We, you know, we had um, a fairly lengthy conversation about termination about two classes ago in which we're thinking about there, there may be moments in telehealth where there is not an obvious way to handle a termination. Someone has determined they don't want to receive telehealth services. It's not for them. Someone has determined that, um, you know, they're moving, they're going to a new jurisdiction, or for whatever reason, they wish to discontinue care or continue care with someone else. You know, in these moments, there may not be an obvious other provider to send that client to. I know for a long time, I practiced into rural Alaska as part of my telehealth practice, and the nearest, you know, doctor's office was hundreds of miles, you know, for some of my clients. So, you know, to me, this is an informed consent issue that we are letting folks know, you know, there may not be a good referral. If, if, telehealth was the only way you know, that they were able to easily get their care. And telehealth is no longer covered by their insurance secondary to the expiration of an executive order. You know, we may be in a bind where it's not easy to find um, a, a good option. And I, I, I'll say that my own practice, what I'm doing is I'm offering a sliding scale to these clients. You know, I'm trying to be thoughtful about long-term, how we're gonna get them referred to a better fit. Um, and, you know, I think that this was something I knew was coming, and so it's something we talked about early on, and we, we figured out a plan. We were not caught unawares. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to check what our jurisdiction um, is requiring of insurance, whether that's going to change, and if there are any clients that will be impacted. All right, so our next musical doctor is Dr. Octagon. Um, Dr. Octagon has a client in early sobriety for methamphetamine use. Um, and initiates therapy in a jurisdiction with a temporary insurance permission. So they live just over the border, you know, to the next state, and that state is permissive regarding going across that border and delivering care during the context of COVID-19. Finances are a significant factor for Dr. Octagon's client. And, you know, Dr. Octagon is aware that there will be eventually an expiration of the order that requires insurance coverage, that this client would struggle to pay for services independently. Um, you know, and, and I think some questions I would have for Dr. Octagon would be, well, how many sessions will the client get, do you think, before there's the expiration? You know, what is your treatment plan? And is it ethical to initiate care when we see the train coming down the tracks? You know, is there other care we could refer to? Again, I'm not saying that there is a definite answer to this, but these are the themes we would think about and document, you know, if Dr. Octagon elected to go forward with the case. Okay. So, David, do we have any questions or should we keep on keeping on? 
You, you know, we don't have any questions, but I just want to double check with you that the insurance website is called trustinsurance.com, you think? Um, American Insurance Trust. Um, okay, I'll look that one up. American Insurance right, Trust. Sorry about that. No. Okay, let's talk a little bit about coronavirus considerations. You know, I, I like to talk about it in terms of the fishbowl. I, I do have this perception that telehealth is under greater scrutiny than in-person care. I, I do think that this is changing, you know, in the context of COVID, it is legitimizing telehealth in a way that, you know, I'd always hoped would happen in terms of telehealth legitimacy, but not like this. Um, it also opens us to greater issues. There's going to be more people doing more wacky stuff. So this is going to be an interesting time in terms of regulation. And this now more than ever, risk management, now more than ever documenting our reasoning, you know, demonstrating good um, Good practices. I think that boards are impressed when they see the investment and thoughtfulness that people put into their practices, and I think it's a worthy investment. Okay, now as a part of our time together that I like to call, that's a good question. So these are questions that I received in the prior week that I thought might be of interest to others, and I wanted to include them. The first is a video. Over the past few weeks, several folks have asked me what I think about delivering care outside. So either where we would be outside delivering care to the client, or our client would be outside while they're receiving video conferencing or telephone based mental health care. And, you know, my answer perhaps um, somewhat cryptically would be yes and. We know that there are guidelines published by the American Psychological Association and other entities that help us think through delivering care outside. In vivo exposure frequently has us working with clients outside of the home, as do other exposure-based therapies. However, in this instance, we'll want to be thoughtful about those issues of risk management, privacy, confidentiality, and information security. So while in prior classes, we have explicitly spoken about how we can best prepare our offices to to be conducive to healthcare appointments over video or telephone. Today, we're going to think a little bit about how that translates to when we move outside the office. So here we are in a room. It's closed. It's reasonably well lit. It's private. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, it would be a reasonable place to have our telehealth appointments. Again, if I were doing this uh, with clients, I would want to be thoughtful about what information I was disclosing. I have some family pictures here, some art. You know, they might know that I enjoy brown wooden dressers. I don't know. But we want to think about what we're comfortable telling clients and what we're less comfortable telling clients. So now we're going to ask some of these same questions in a different environment. So here we are in a new potential environment. Now in this instance, we happen to be on the back deck of my home. And I wanna note a few things. First, we're gonna note the light. I think our lighting remains pretty consistently good, but I want you to take some note of the sound. Now I happen to live in the city of Seattle and I'm trying to speak a little bit loudly because I can hear a couple of streets over, maybe the trash truck is coming through. And I think this detracts a little bit from the sound. There's also some ambient wind noise and some other noise. Now I suspect the sound gate is going to pick up some of them. Remember that the sound gate is that device, excuse me, that aspect of our software that keeps um, some of the ambient noise from coming through on our video conferencing call. That being said, it's not perfect. And you know, at times, um, some of that sound is gonna come through. Now I think perhaps the most important piece is going to be privacy, confidentiality, security. Now, in this case, I live in a city and city houses are close. I grew up in rural Ohio. If we were at my childhood home in rural Ohio, the nearest person would be a couple miles away and we'd be A-OK. -okay. However, that's not where we are. And I'm gonna pivot my screen to show you a little bit of where we are. There's my house, okay, and there's my neighbor's house. It's actually so close that where I so inclined, I could reach over and shake hands with my neighbors uh, side of their house pretty easily. So this is pretty darn close. And were I thinking about discussing protected health information out here, I think that would be problematic. This is why I typically don't deliver video conferencing outside, but I acknowledge, you know, I said yes and, there may be some portions of my house that I would. This house happens to be very skinny and tall. So if I were on the third floor balcony of my home, you cannot be overheard speaking up there. That's something I would contemplate. But again, honestly, it's not something I do. I'm a little more, I don't know, 
I get a little worried about it, but I think that would be a reasonable thing to consider if I double checked and made sure that it's not possible to overhear what I'm saying up there. So, you know, again, we're always thinking about privacy, confidentiality, and information security. Now, I want to acknowledge that it's going to be a little bit different on the client end. Some of our clients are going to feel really strongly about being outside. The weather is getting nicer. Many of us have been cooped up due to the coronavirus, and people are really ready to be outside. Perhaps it's clinically salient for your client to be outside, secondary to the need for exposure or something you know that's relevant to their treatment. In those instances, I feel like this is really a matter of informed consent. We're going to spend a little bit of time asking why. Why are we doing this? Is this necessary for the client's treatment? Is it necessary for their privacy and confidentiality? Is it necessary for their well-being? In some instances, I believe that we find superior privacy and confidentiality going outside. I work with some clients where there is not a single space in their home where they will not be overheard, but they happen to live in a place that's quite isolated, and if they went out, you know, a few hundred feet out into their yard, you know, they would feel with some confidence they would be not overheard and that would actually be a better environment for their care. So, you know, if I felt that we could do this in a way that was conducive to not having too much ambient noise, you know, they could have something where the camera was sitting steadily and not Blair Witch Project uh, shaking all over, then I think that this is something we could do. And again, this is going to be an informed consent conversation between you and your client in which you make sure they are aware of the risks to their privacy, security, and confidentiality when you take something outside, just as we would do if we were engaged in some sort of in vivo exposure, just if we were do if we were walking with a client. These are the same types of conversations. I received another question, oops, which I thought was very interesting and I wanted to share, that related to telephone emergencies over state lines. Someone talked about receiving an emergent phone call from their client outside their jurisdiction. So again, you know, we'd be thoughtful about where's the client, where am I? you know, am I licensed there? And, you know, is there a conflict to be resolved? I, I also want to acknowledge that if it's an emergent call, you know, those are things I'm probably going to look up later. My first responsibility is going to be addressing the, remer the emergency. I will note that um, 911 is sort of the standard of who we are calling if we need to involve some type, some type of um, emergency services going to the client. In the old days, it used to be the case that we looked up the local dispatch number for 911 local to where the client was located, and that was the number we contacted. These days, however, they're usually pretty darn good at getting the call to the right area within the jurisdiction where the client is located. So it's one of those things that it's not optimal, you know, because again, we could be in a circumstance where we're practicing not licensed into a jurisdiction. And I'll tell you anecdotally, if it's an emergent call, you know, that's going to be my first priority. Now, if I received really every time my client left the jurisdiction, if I was routinely, you know, receiving emergency calls, it would be a clinical issue that I'd want to be addressing with my client. And I would want to be proactive in making a plan as to how to um, think through this issue because if it's you know if it's a once in a while thing versus a very regular thing you know then my risk is is increasing with each time. I had a question I thought was very interesting about informed consent, um, specifically you know when we are managing risk for youth over telehealth, you know whose consent do we need to deliver services to? Who must we? Um, inform. And this is a great example of where your jurisdiction may vary from others. You know, themes like privacy, themes like consent and who must give their consent for care, and themes like um, how much we are permitted to inform caretakers of concerns vary interjurisdictionally. So this is a great example in terms of um, risk management as it intersects with uh, interjurisdictional practice. Okay. So I saw a couple questions come up and I want to just save the last few minutes for uh, maybe a couple more if we have them, David. Yes, and I, it, it's some of some nice questions because it's kind of almost sounds like a little bit of a wrap up question. Um, one in particular, um, you talked about precautions that you take to ensure clients don't record the session. Could you go mm -hmm. over that a little bit? Well, you know, it's, it's a lot of trust, I <laughs> say. Um, you know, I definitely am using products, video conferencing products that are difficult to record. So, you know, some video conferencing products, you are able, either party is able to enable recording, some only the 
one person is able to enable recording and some no one's able to enable recording. I happen to use products where for the most part, no one is able to enable recording and that helps me feel secure. That being said, um, I'm certainly, nothing prohibits my client from using their mobile device, you know, or setting up an elaborate camera studio outside of view of our telemental health appointment. So this is something that I talk about as part of informed consent and, you know, I mentioned my expectation that information is maintained as private and that there will be no recordings. It's actually in my informed consent document. Um, and, you know, and this is not exclusive to telehealth. I've, I had a really sad consult case where um, a colleague was seeing someone who was the victim of domestic violence. And indeed, it turned out that they were coming with a mobile device hidden in their bag, recording it because the only reason they were allowed to leave the house was the understanding that they would be recording the session so their uh, partner could listen to it later. So it's not it's not an issue exclusive to telehealth. I think it's more easily enabled over telehealth. You know, someone might be in the room with the client, someone might be recording something. They just can't see what's going on in the environment around the client. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> um, another question similar, uh, kind of a uh, going back on some other topic. Is there anything additional that you would recommend or consider when working with multiple people in a session like family-based therapies? Great question. I mean, for me, the biggest question is whether we want them, well, first of all, what technology devices are available, what is possible, you know, and second of all, if there are multiple devices available, do we want them contacting us from separate devices or do we want them all in front of one device? That to me is the biggest question. Mm -hmm. When possible, if they're set up for it, I like them all in front of one device because then I can see all the little moments, you know, where one person looks at another person, you know, gives them a little head shake, you know, the, is there some obvious triangulation happening? You know, I, I like to see that, that context and it can be totally impractical, you know, if everybody's having to squish in uncomfortably, you know, in front of a single camera and it's just not going to work, it's certainly not going to be a good session. So for me, you know, I'm thinking a little bit about the number of people, what devices are available, what technology is possible, you know, what orientation from the camera could be feasible for the session. And that, that's probably the thing I'm most thinking about. Okay. And me, a video conferencing product that has multi-caller, because if you don't have that, you got troubles. And, and somebody wanted to know, um, the, uh, I think they're not, I'm not sure if they're asking you directly, but which, which therapy program um, do you use or is used and how much is it kind of monthly or annually? I think they're trying to get a sense about which one and how much are they? Sure. I mean, there are lots of them. I, I, I'll tell you, I have four right now. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind of a weird one of this. So I, I use the electronic medical record simple practice. It's, it's pretty big in the space. And I, it's for $10 a month, I pay for their video conferencing feature. I think they themselves are like $50 a month. So I'm paying the $10 add on fee for that. Um, I also have doxy.me, which is free, and I use that. Um, I also have, and this is running out, and I'm so sad because I'm going to have to pay for it myself, a PHI compliant, a HIPAA compliant, excuse me, a version of Zoom. And if I want to be a sport and pay for it, it's going to be around $300 a month to keep up what I have, which mm -hmm. I'll think about that. And then I have a, still a VC account, which I think runs me around $30 a month. Wow. Um, you, you talked wow. about having backups. Uh, it sounds like you have yeah. a backup or two. I do. I do. And I mean, for me, I, I'm also tinkering to see, I'm tinkering with them for other reasons, but I think having two is a good idea. Um, and you know, there, there are free ones. There are lots of good free ones out there. So I think, you know, you can easily have two free ones, you know, that you use as your backup. So I don't think it has to be a, a mess of a massive cost to someone's practice. Um, well, I think that's kind of it on the, the final questions coming in. One person said GoToMeeting is uh, oh, HIPAA compliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But some final words, Sarah? Well, really, I just want to thank everyone for their interest in the work. And I want to thank Northwest ATTC for having me. Um, this has been just a delight. I've so enjoyed the questions and I, the comments. I think they've been fascinating. Um, I really just appreciate, you know, whether you've taken two hours tonight or you've been here all six um, of these installations, I appreciate your, your interest and, and your commitment to delivering good care via telehealth. We need more folks like you. So I just want to thank you for being here. And thank you, David. And thank you, Jen, for just a really great experience. Wonderful. And we're, we're amazingly grateful to you, too. This, this has been a, a very in-depth um, uh, 
training series and, and the comments that I get in the chat box are just very supportive of the work that uh, and the training that you've provided us. So thank you very much, Dr. Oh, Smucker. And so some of the final bit of business is, first, I'd like to say thank you to the North SATTC and staff, uh, Jennifer and other folks that are behind the scenes that kind of made this happen. Uh, it's been a team effort and we really appreciate that. Uh, I put the link to our survey. Sure appreciate if folks would take a minute to uh, fill that out. We'll also follow up tomorrow morning uh, with an email uh, that has the survey in it too. And then I'll talk with uh, Dr. Smucker to make sure that we got that right uh, insurance company email. I, I tried to find it and I didn't have any success. So you and I maybe could take a minute and make sure we get that and send it to folks. So with that, thank you to all the participants. You folks have been wonderful. Here we are, 125 people right to the very last second. So thank you all and best wishes in your practice going forward. Good night. Mm-mm. <clears throat>